I am an American and I want the civilization to continue to grow and to focus on being more enlightened. Why would we want people to go to school for 15, 16, 17 years and then get a job and not be able to start performing right away? You know, we get to create something that starts out with no real vocabulary because it's new to this planet. Major funding for Arab American Stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by The United States prides itself on being a nation of innovators, and these Arab Americans are part of that tradition. Imad Mahawili saw a problem in the third world and set out to fix it. Okay. Amir Abu Shair created a program that inspires students to seek math and science careers. And Brian and Leon Dewan have invention in their blood and music in their souls. They marry the two in something they call Dewanatron. With an eye towards a greener future, Dr. Imad Mahawili envisions a day when wind will become a significant source of power. His latest invention is a small wind turbine designed to reach some of the world's 1.6 billion people without electricity. Well, then you need to check the, um, the junction box before we do this test again. I am a chief technical officer and one of two founders for Windtronics a company that's bringing to market a breakthrough technology in the small wind business. This is good. Okay, come back here. Uh, we want to make sure the turbine is stable at high, high, full fan speed. I am an American and I want the civilization to continue to grow and to focus on being more enlightened about the fundamentals of what drives a society and that is energy. Going on. Our six-foot turbine generates about 1,000 to 1,500 kilowatt hours a year and has a strong potential to reach the corners of the world where there is no electricity. That's very nice. It looks good. This is my seventh startup in my career. And while we work very hard, we work very intensely, but we work very smart. It's not about time, it's about ideas and solutions. That's excellent. It was my father who burned into me hard work and ethical work as the path to success and he's turned out to be 100% right. My father was a retired military officer in Baghdad, Iraq. I was the youngest of eight children. And my father, he was a tough love guy, but he gave me the freedom to explore my talents. Growing up, I remember having prisms to play with the diffraction of light. And sometimes I would try to make perfume by distilling rose petals. And that's a very big story because it causes a little explosion in the flask that I was using. And that's, this is the fun stuff that I was exploring. Spending that year, the freedom of thought, the freedom of action takes over you. And so the freedom and the protection that uh, the society offers our individuals makes me a very proud American indeed. I came up with the very small turban concept when I was with my family. It was a Christmas 2004. We were on our way to uh, Orlando, Florida to spend a week there for a Christmas vacation. Um, understandably, we're from Michigan, so it's very cold. And so we were in Atlanta in the airport and then watched the news. It's coming in. It's coming again. It's coming again? Yeah. <laughs> so the tsunami hit, and I was simply shocked to see what was happening in that end of the world. Yeah. And learned about Bane Aceh and the devastation of that area. The magnitude of that tsunami was unbelievable. 
not only the loss of life, but also the difficulty of helping people. And to imagine these people and how they continue to survive in an environment where there is no power, no light, that left quite an imprint on me for the human condition in those areas. After the tsunami, I spent several months reflecting on this. The United States has an abundance of energy, and our energy is cheap. We have the largest 27% of the world coal reserves are in the United States, whereas many parts of the world are completely dependent on the availability of very, very expensive energy. These are wind speed delineations. Yep, these are just the wind speed what bins. Is, what is this 25? Doing the research, I found that wind is fairly prevalent in those areas, but the most wind turbines end up being very costly, very inefficient. So my goal is to focus on the potential creative solution that embodies uh, economics and, and technology. The challenge of developing wind technologies is you have to not only test it as an electric generator, but more important, you have to test it as a response machine to a wind flow. And wind, as I always say to my colleagues, wind is, which means a wind has its own mind. It comes and goes every few seconds. So the wind turbine has to be responsive to it. This truck allows us to test the, the upper end limits of the turbine in our electronics. We can actually make 40 miles an hour wind if we need to, not rely on natural wind. Some people actually follow us for the loop and follow us back to the office and say, is that, is that a wind turbine powered truck? And that's typically the conversation, including the, the law enforcement office. When they come in here, they're curious about it, but they're excited about it. Our turbine is installed on top of the roof of the tech center. And the real technological development here is that most wind turbines are typically three-bladed. They use gears in the center hub of the turbine. We decided to actually do the opposite, turn the standard turbine technology inside out, eliminate the gears, and put the electric generation at the perimeter. And when we do that, it ends up being efficient, cost-effective, and very quiet. Okay, so he's distributing through, Ger through Germany. We're already in India in early test stages. We are here, we're in Europe. The past nine to 10 months, we shipped about a thousand turbines worldwide. Excuse me, guys. Uh, I, I think we should review what's happening in India. Constantly updating our design performance and we're educating and training our dealers. Let's go in there and examine the drawings. Tell me what this is saying. I mean, I, I don't follow the circus quite well. I have the great pleasure in actually challenge because they challenged me in working with two of my children. Sarah and Mark. And essentially. And then that idea. would be what we would ship them as a product yeah. so that they could implement it into the system that already exists. What do you think, Mark? Doable? Yeah, it's very doable. I, I agree. And so mm -hmm. let's actually push on converting a smart box, bring it here for testing. I love working for my dad. He is very intense. He also is very passionate and very um, he, deeply human and emotional. What's your proposal? I got I downloaded this morning. I think we all have a great sense of contribution to his vision. The wind market is slated to be growing every year, and I think we could actually create new industry, just like if we, you and I were talking in 1911 before the automobile became so ubiquitous, and there would be say there would be highways, you know, uh, there would be manufacturing of the automobile industry. Now I'm talking to you, I'm saying they could be wind highways. Thanks guys, I think we're, we're done with this test. We make R&D look easy. Sure, yeah. <laughs> we have to find ways creatively, because we are Americans, of how to continue this great civilization. Amir Abu Shair takes an innovative approach to science education. He was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship in 2010 for inspiring and preparing public high school students for careers in science and math. I think that we've become so focused on academic content in schools and college readiness that we've kind of written everything off as else as, you know, vocational, not really taking into account that people learn through a variety of different media. 
and working on machines and tools is one way that we can do that. I mean, the human hands, that's how babies learn. How do you teach someone physics if they've never are engaging in physical things. I talk to my students and go, have you ever done this? Because I did it when I was a kid, but all those hands-on things have been removed from the schools, and the kids kind of look at me, no, I haven't. <laughs> this is the new student machine shop in the new Ealing Center for Engineering Education. And Dos Povos High School, it's my alma mater. I graduated from here in 1990, and then I came back here after working in industry as an engineer. I uh, decided to become a teacher and I taught physics and then ultimately had this vision of you know, what we could be doing with students in terms of education and, and strengthening their education. So we have one major goal today, okay? We, you know what we're doing. We're basically, we've moved in here and we're trying to do robotics, Monday night robotics in here. And the only way that can happen is if all the machinery is up and running. Real cool. Finish this table right now. Okay. So I want to be clear on one thing. Even though I had real world experience, I came into education and immediately fell lockstep back into the traditional educational model. It's so entrenched in our educational DNA that getting out of it is very difficult. I was teaching AP classes and I was, the students were doing fantastically. You know, they were getting the best scores. They were all getting fives and you know, I was feeling really good about myself. Look at I'm achieving all the goals. I'm getting all these stamps of approval. And then five years in, and we started the robotics project. And I said, we're going to do this now. This is going to be our capstone course. The students couldn't apply any of the physics I had taught them to the robot because they had been learning it in abstraction. The robot is a challenge. The kids and myself received the challenge to build and design a robot to achieve a task. And then in order to actually achieve the robot, the types of things they have to do go well beyond what is typically taught in an academic setting. You know, the kids are calling up suppliers. They're working with people. These are soft skills. They're trying to understand things they haven't ever, you know, negotiated before. They're working in completely unfamiliar realms. They work with, you know, mentors and adults in industry coming from industry, and that's different than what you normally would find in a school setting, working as part of a team to really achieve a goal. This was the robot for last year's competition. Every year there's a different one. Right now we just powered on the robot and now we have to wait for uh, the, the robot to connect to our laptop. It uses a wireless connection so it's got to get booted up. So, enable. And now we're ready to drive. Okay. Zero. And zero. I operate the forklift and uh, the claw and Jake drives the robot. Uh, red tube? Alright. The first second uh, that you accelerate with this robot is faster than that of a car. Mm -hmm. um, we have all four wheels are powered. Because of our transmissions uh, team and you know, the programming that we do and uh, our pneumatics and everything else, our forklift is like world record speeds. If anyone's keeping track of forklift speeds, is a world record. The match is like two minutes long, uh, so we need to be able to both move around the field as quickly as possible in that time and hang the tubes as quickly as we could to get the highest score we can because you get more points for every tube you hang. We're, I think, rounding out the picture and we're moving away from this kind of myopic approach to education which is just, you know, it's, it's about learning content till till the end of college and then, then you go into a job and you don't know how to do anything and, and employers complain about this. What do you got? Just a couple more wheel, wheel screws, right? Okay, perfect. Why would we want people to go to school for 15, 16, 17 years and then get a job and not be able to start performing right away? I mean, that, that's ludicrous. You guys. We're going to try to take these machines and power them up all at once, okay? We're trying to test the surge current. Okay, is everybody ready? On three, on three. One, two, three. People often ask me, um, do I want my students to become engineers? And no, I want them to follow their passion. I just think engineering and problem solving is a really good foundation for doing kind of anything. 
I, for example, am going into music, but I can use the skills that I've learned um, in my presentations team, um, in the events team to organize events. It'll help me get gigs um, and make a lot of connections um, that, you know, I'm not applying that to engineering in my future, um, but it's a lot of great experience that I can use in kind of whatever field any of us go into. So my dad's a landscaper, but he had a, has a PhD in physics. I'd say work together to unbox one. He grew up in Iraq, and he was kind of groomed to go be a physicist. That's it, the culture there it was much more about, you're good at this, we're going to steer you in this direction. He graduated number one in his, his country in math, uh, was a, a brilliant theoretical physicist, but did not enjoy physics. And he embraced the American dream, which was the freedom to actually think for himself and do what he wanted to do. And he realized that working as a PhD researcher was not something he was interested in. You can do whatever you want. People told me I had to be this or I had to be that. And I turned out, you know, I said, I don't want to do engineering. I want to do this other thing. I want to do this education. And it's been wildly successful. And it was because I followed my passion and because I followed the American dream of just setting out and making your own way. That's what I got from him, and that's kind of what he got from coming to this country. And I think people could learn from that. Mr. Shire has done a really, really good job of making it 50% girls, 50% boys. I don't feel any resistance being a girl in the engineering academy. Why this is important to me that everyone feels included is that, you know, I'm an Arab American, and there, when I went to this school, and still, there's very few, you know, people of Middle Eastern descent at this school. And I definitely had that hard time fitting in. At the end of the day, people break up you know, into their race identity, their gender identity, etc. At the end of the day, when everybody broke off into their own groups, I was just there standing alone. And it wasn't that I didn't have friends, I did, but there was just that missing, you know, connection with a community. And that's helped me, I think, realize kind of like that humanity is the community and that we do compartmentalize ourselves too much. At least in our little microcosm, we can kind of generate, you know, what I think is a model for the way, you know, humanity can be. Cousins Brian and Leon Dewan combine music, art, and invention into Wanatron, a family of electronic instruments they design and build that fuses music with technology in unpredictable ways. You can hear their Swarmatron on the soundtrack of the movie The Social Network. The company is called Dewanatron, and we came up with it in 2002 as a way of describing the musical instruments we build and the musical projects we do together with these instruments. My father's family came from Lebanon. The whole family was Sephardic Jew, and they'd left Lebanon for political reasons, because it was still under Turkish rule. And um, my dad grew up in New York, and he was an inventor. And um, I owe so much inspiration to him because growing up as an inventor's son was a wonderfully educational and inspiring experience. Oh, when I was about six or seven, he said, Lee, you want to learn how to solder? And I said, sure. So he gave me a soldering iron and showed me how to make simple solder joints. And then by the time I was nine or ten, he had me building various things for him and soldering circuits together. We would go to visit them and, and uh you know, I didn't really know what Uncle Leon was up to. I mean, sometimes I'd see some of the, the corrugated cardboard and wire prototypes and stuff, and my father and he would argue about various things uh, in a sort of fun-loving way. Uh, but I didn't really know what the stuff he was working on was. One Christmas, I showed Brian this thing that I had just discovered, which was when you get in... Texas, when you get a Texas Instruments calculator from 1980, because this was in 1980, and you put it near a detuned AM radio, you start getting noises out of the radio, because in those days, calculators calculated at audio frequencies. So I showed him how, like, if you start pressing buttons on this calculator when it's near the radio, you get different tones out of it, and when you divide by zero, it did this flashing error thing that went like... So then Brian was like, whoa! What about this electronic game that you just got for Christmas, which was this memory game? 
And so I said, well, try it. So we ended up doing this five minute composition without even realizing it, but I had this old tape recorder turned on. And to this day, it's still like one of the favorite, you know, the, in my opinion, like the, one of the best things I've ever been involved in. It was like one of those sort of magic things where no one really knows what's going on, but this whole structured composition takes place and then goes off in some direction, then comes back to its original theme and then goes off into outer space. And that was the very first electronic music I'd ever made. Well, I, I, when I was a little kid, I liked the idea of being a scientist. Uh, that wasn't really what I was cut out for, uh, though I was interested in it. Uh, but I was mostly interested in drawing art and also music. And my father played organ, and my brother Ted and I both grew up playing organ because he played organ. And uh, so that was a big part of my growing up, and that was my orientation with music. And later I got into things like zithers and auto harps and stuff like that. Leon and I started working around 2002 on doing these projects. It started out very informally, uh, really just conversations about instruments and synthesis, and particularly synthesis and synthesizers, and we came up with some ideas, and Leon started designing some circuits. And Yeah, I'd been wanting to build a synthesizer since I was 11, because when I was a kid, I thought the coolest thing you could possibly do was make a circuit that made music. This is called the dual primate console because it requires two people to operate it and you tell it how to play rhythms by dialing in a number. Let's play together with both halves. So what a synthesizer is, is a way of generating sound with electricity, and you have a collection of devices to shape different aspects of the sound. So rather than making a physical or mechanical vibration in the air, you're vibrating air with a speaker, which is being told what to do by these electric currents that you're shaping with your things. Here's the Swarmatron. The way the Swarmatron works is you have a, a couple of these ribbons that control it, that you play it with. This is the pitch ribbon, and you it'll articulate when you press down on the ribbon and then you can move the pitch up and down like this. And uh, so now you're hearing one note, but the Swarmatron has eight oscillators and you can switch them on and they're slightly detuned from each other. So you get this choral effect. And then you can spread them out even further with this swarm ribbon. The more you play up on this, the more they spread apart until you get this beehive sound. People do like to play with them. I think the Swarmatron is a kind of a favorite for musicians and, and people without musical backgrounds because you can just get in there and start shaping things. And so people uh, get excited about them and want one. We've actually been spending a lot of time building instruments in the past year. That's been the main focus of Duanatron because there is actually now demand for some of our instruments like the Swarmatron and the Melody Gen. I'd liked to make these things that were kind of architectural sculptures that were like grandfather clocks and things. And so uh, Leon started making these circuits and things. And then later I wanted to make a sort of organ console like thing for them. And, and so what started out as this much more informal thing became more codified and more refined as we went along. Yeah, currently our process is we both think of what the instrument is going to do and its basic architecture, and then Brian designs the layout and the cabinetry, and I design and fabricate the circuitry. And then we put it all together. I really love to hear things that I've built. And I don't know, I guess it's just one of those things where I just really enjoy the process of designing something and then playing it and then having it have this unusual and different sound. You know, we get to create something that starts out with no real vocabulary because it's new to this planet. And then as we start playing with these instruments, we start add adding to the vocabulary of it. And then as other people get their hands on them, they too add to the vocabulary of it. So there's something very satisfying about coming up with something that's a result of bang knocking these ideas back, in, in, back and forth and then 
setting it free in the world and watching it build up a life of its own. Whatever you do, if you can do something that's off the beaten path and original and enjoy it, go with it. I am Neda Ulavi. Hope to see you next week for more Arab American stories. Major funding for Arab American stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by 